imagine like every Singaporean try to relax a little bit more. <laughs> Singapore wouldn't be as competitive as it is right now. Lah. Meet Kelvin, a personal finance YouTuber. In 2007, he moved to Singapore from Malaysia and just two years ago, he became a Singaporean citizen. Kelvin shared with me what it feels like to renounce Malaysian citizenship, how he left his corporate job to start earning 20k a month as a YouTuber and his plans for early retirement. I'm Max, Kelvin's fellow content creator. Let's go! Was it difficult for you to convert, like, psychologically from Malaysia to Singapore? Actually, not, not so much, because, like, both Singapore and Malaysia, their culture are more or less the same. Even though I feel that Malaysia food are better. <laughs> <laughs> just, that's just my personal opinion. Singapore is an import of all the good foods. Mala come from where? It came from China. You eat Japanese food, came from Japan. You eat uh, all the Middle Eastern food, or it came from Middle East. Probably chicken rice, is it, is it, did it come from Singapore? I have no idea. <laughs> for, but for Malaysia, if you go to the hawker stores, the people who are running the hawker stores are the owner themselves. Same for some, some of the shopping mall foods. Uh. So I would say Malaysia food is a lot more home cooked food as compared to Singapore. Uh. It's much less, uh, I don't know, industrialized uh, franchise kind of style. Yeah. If you just trace the roots back like 50 years ago, Malaysians and Singaporeans, they are more or less the same because their grandparents all came from the same place, from China. Um, yeah from the Fujian area, from the Cantonese area. Yeah, all of them just came here and we are just the third or fourth generation down. Culturally wise, I wouldn't think there's much difference. So mm. yeah, it's quite easy to adapt. La. So like no hard feelings? <laughs> no, there's no hard feelings. In fact, actually I like Singapore a lot more than Malaysia. Okay, oh. I don't have much experience working in Malaysia. I do feel that like Singapore, there's a lot of things that's a lot more efficient. Like, okay, for example, first is Singapore is a very small place. Just to travel from one place to the other place is take at most, at most one and a half hours. But for Malaysia, if you want to travel to another place, from the top to bottom is already like 11 hours. Not to say I, I travel that often, it's just that I find it very tedious to move, to go from one place to another. The place where I'm from, uh, Ipoh, the public transport is not as good. So I have, I have to drive everywhere. And yeah. I don't really like driving. Yeah. It gives me this, I'm always scared that I will crash into some other car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So having this public transport thing is a, is a plus for me. Then the other thing is like, everything just moves a lot faster here. Uh, like for the government sector. Every time I go back, when I have to deal with the government stuff, like uh, do my Malaysian driving license, I have to go that place twice and each time the queue is insane. I hate going there. <laughs> uh, but for Singapore, everything can be done online. Uh, there's no issue. They can just mail you the entire passport, that kind of thing. Yeah, but that's not possible in Malaysia. Overall, everything just gets done a lot faster here compared to Malaysia. La. I interviewed this guy, he was also Malaysian, become Singaporean. And people like in the audience, they're like, oh, you're a traitor, some people like. <laughs> they, they think Malaysians, when they know, when they find out that you uh, you converted to Singaporean, they're like offended. Or... So yeah, okay. So for, for the first thing about the being traitor, right? If you were to talk about being traitors, then we have to go the roots back all the way to our ancestors, right? They would have just stayed in um, Africa. <laughs> Yeah. the first civilization came from. In, according to that theory, every of our ancestors are traded all the way down to <laughs> your generation. Yeah. So, there's nothing much to be traitors about. Yeah. I think in the end, we are all responsible for our own happiness. Even if I stay in Malaysia or, or not, I can't contribute as much to Malaysia. Okay, maybe in Texas, just a few thousand dollars in Texas. But other than that, I, I, I don't feel that like I owe the country anything to stay there. Yeah, I, I've paid my taxes there also, so I don't owe them anything. When, when I reviewed that I was a Malaysian, their first question was like, um, have you done NS? <laughs> because to them, right, they feel like in order to be a true blue Singaporean, you have to do the two years NS national service where you have to uh, train to become an army or anything. But I do contribute in terms of taxes, in terms of right now, it's probably the knowledge, the investing knowledge that I put out. Uh, and I don't litter around. <laughs> I don't do illegal stuff. I, I, in Chinese, it's called Hao Ming, becoming a good citizen of Singapore. <laughs> yeah. Again, that's at the least that I can contribute to the country. I think there's a much more deeper thing going on than just me coming in. Because like people who talk about all these things are people who, I, I, I guess, they might be hating on the government for allowing all this to happen. Again, it's this between them and the government kind of thing, like the government policy that allows this to happen. But if we just take a step back and we think, what if the government doesn't allow this to happen? Singapore wouldn't be where it is today. Like, for example, the house that you stay in <coughs> is not built by Singaporeans. Even the whole country being developed 
prior to the whole Lee Kuan Yew thing. It was founded by the British and all the immigrants who came into Singapore to contribute, right? All the Chinese, Indians, Malays. Singapore is, in the end, is an immigrant country, much like what New York is, what, much like what US is. So without all this, Singapore wouldn't be where it is today. What do you don't like about Singapore? I feel that like, Singapore is a country that plays very heavy emphasis on hard work. How, what I mean by that is that as a kid, you are taught to study hard so that you can enter university. And in university, you have to study even harder <laughs> so that you can find a good job. And when you get a good job, you have to work hard so that you can at least beat your, uh, climb up the whole uh, career ladder thing. And when you reach the end of that, oh, suddenly you are 60 years old <laughs> and you are ready to retire. <laughs> so that's the typical yeah. Singapore life. I would say it's a good life if you stick to it because it guarantees you that you have enough money to live on. And that, that is also what the government says and that is what they do also. You can see it through their policy. For example, like when the mom gives birth to a kid, she only has three months maternity leave while the guy only has, I think, two weeks paid leave and I think one month unpaid leave. Well, if you look at European countries, adult, they will have one year. So each will get like six months, six months kind of leave. Adult, they will have 12 years, uh, 12 months. 12 months leave uh, to spend with their kid. So for those countries, their, their emphasis is more on like family, bonding, love, kind of thing. But for Singapore, <laughs> it's like, okay, you have produced a new worker for us. How come, get back, get back to work. <laughs> get back yeah. to work. Singapore is this place where you have to rely on yourself to get yourself up. But if you do get yourself up, uh, I think you are more or less set for life because Singapore is a place that rewards hard work. I guess it's uh, like compared to Europe, it's definitely Europe more relaxed. Spain, France is more relaxed. You cannot fire the employee in France. You will be screwed as a company if you try to fire someone. I do see why the government is like more or less forcing us to do this because human talent is the only is the only resource they have. Imagine like every Singaporean try to relax a little bit more. <laughs> Singapore wouldn't be as competitive as it is right now. La. The whole situation would be a lot different. People wouldn't be coming to Singapore to do all this kind of thing. La. That's the thing that I like and don't like about, about this. La. But that's just Singapore. That's why I guess Singapore is not for everyone. When people say like Singapore is a perfect place, like for me, it's a perfect place. But for some people, it's a terrible place yes. because they don't want to be so stressed. Let's talk about your YouTube career. Yeah. So how, how long have you been doing YouTube for? Uh, since 2020, right before the COVID. I guess for me, it happened right at the correct time. When this whole COVID thing happened, I had like, we were all asked to work from home. So I had an extra two hours. I don't have to travel to work anymore. That two hours allowed me to work on this whole YouTube thing. Maybe I might have uh, used a bit of office hours to do a bit of YouTube, but maybe. Uh, and I was lucky enough that all the brokers, they all came in also around the same time. So it also helped my channel when I talk about them and when people were searching for all this. Because prior to this, without all these brokers, right, the rest, all the bank brokers were charging like $20, $25, per trade. When, but when all these brokers came in, they were only charging like $1 per trade. <laughs> so naturally everyone just moved to these brokers. There was a huge interest and I was right at the place where I, take, where I, can, where I could tell them that, oh, look at these brokers. Yeah. Uh, here, how, here you can sign up to them. Oh, by the way, that's a new sign up reward. I guess that helped my channel to grow a lot during that period. La. But yeah. after that, people knew who I am and they continued watching for, for my content. And at some point you were laid off from your company, is it correct? Or you Correct. Quit? I believe it was in 2022. I wanted to quit only in 2023. Maybe I might have got, got the years wrong. Like. Basically, I wanted to quit this year. The company closed down one year prior to that. But at that time, I, my YouTube income was actually higher <laughs> than my day <laughs> job. Yeah. So it was actually more or less equal. <laughs> la. I decided like, why not just give this a try since I got it up and, up and running already. In worst case, I'll just go back to find another programmer job, <laughs> become an office worker. But th thankfully, I, did, I didn't have to go back to work. La. Hey guys, quick one. If you ever thought about starting a YouTube channel and make a living out of it and share your knowledge and creativity with the audience, consider joining a waiting list for my side hustle, YouTube Mastery. It's a 12 month comprehensive program that teaches you how to gain thousands of views and subscribers and most importantly how to make money from your channel link in description i love this job and because i was laid off i was able to work even more hours i'm working about 12 hours right now a day <laughs> uh, on weekends add up it's also about 12 hours maybe it might have impacted my health <laughs> i can relate to it like now i'm super busy with this course and I guess my working load maybe 80 because I also work weekends, I work nights. For me, it's kind of fulfilling. Correct. 
It's not like obliged to. It's, I'm not in McKinsey and they push you to work like 100 hours. It's kind of my choice. I know that I'm working for my future as well. So for you, it's kind of similar kind of attitude? Yes. So for me, the thing that I'm always worried about is that when will my channel die? <laughs> when will China die? Because uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know about you, but I always feel that like I'm always at the mercy of YouTube. The, the moment they change the algorithm or the moment the advertisers spend <clears throat> less money, I'm screwed already. That's the part that I'm worried about because it's, it's not stable. So unless I create a course for myself, until then, I, I would say I haven't crossed that bridge yeah. yet. So for now, I'm still, ah, am I, do I have enough money to pay myself? Um, that, that kind of thing. I want to pay my employees that kind of thing. But maybe that next month, next year, that is going to change. Lah. Would you ever go back to the stable corporate job? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> right now, in the past, you, you work hard, your boss say, oh, Congrats, uh, thanks for working hard. Um, <laughs> I've bought a new car. <laughs> Please work harder next year. But for myself, right, right now, I, I work hard. I can directly get my own reward. I guess the, that's the good thing. The bad thing is there's no stability. La. <laughs> I wake up every day like, uh, do, I have, do, I earn myself, do I earn enough money myself this month? So that's the part I'm worrying about right now. You made this video two years ago, I think, that you're making 20K from YouTube. 20K, is it is a combination of all the income sources, including my job, my YouTube, ah, including uh, your job my, as well. my investments, all this add up together, is 20K. So I guess like YouTube made you like maybe 10 plus something. Uh, it's about somewhere between 6 to 10K la, a, a month. Since then, how much you progressed in terms of uh, uh, revenue from YouTube? I guess at least two, three X. 2-3x. Yeah, I'm just, it, it was just because I worked 2-3x more wow. as compared to previous before. But like, yeah. Previously, I was just churning out two videos a week. Mm. Now, I'm, I'm doing like four videos a week. Sometimes, like last week, there was this whole TD Ameritrade, the broker closing down and everyone was like panicking. Oh, where should I move my money? Yeah. So that, that week, I was producing like six videos because people were like, oh, where should I look at? Uh, Kelvin, can we help me? So I was doing six videos. I was like, oh, I was, I'm not getting enough sleep. But at least, these videos help people, at, at least it will calm their fears. Lah. Can you share how much you make from monetization, views, from the views? From YouTube itself, it's about 3 to 4K a month, 3,000 to 4,000 a month. Yeah. But this is actually considered quite low. The peak was uh, about two years ago, 2021. During the COVID period, every mm. other company was spending a ton of money on to ads. Yeah. My <laughs> peak, I was earning like 15K SGD from ads alone. 15k. 15k. That wow, was, that was like, amazing. Back then, I was already calculating. Wow, I can buy this condo in like how many months? <laughs> <laughs> uh, then after that, it, it kept dropping. I like, oh, my condo and my condo just floated away. Uh, right now, more of the income comes from the affiliate sponsorship. Not so much. It's mostly from the affiliates right now, lah. So affiliates is now more than than the revenue from yeah, YouTube. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you plan like so? You will double your income let's say, in three years. <laughs> From YouTube and all the products around YouTube? For me, my immediate goal is to reach $1 million. Uh, uh, like net worth or revenue? Or? Uh, no, net worth. In terms of investment, investment portfolio. portfolio. Yeah. Because with this portfolio, it allows me to have passive income of like 3 k to 4 k uh, a month. Yeah. Basically, if, as long as you just withdraw this amount, technically the, your money in the portfolio, it wouldn't run out forever. Yeah, so there's a whole study done behind it. Lah. My immediate goal is to reach $1 million so that I don't have to worry about money as much. Then after that, I wouldn't, I would stop working as hard. Yeah. <laughs> right now, I'm working at like 80 hours a week. 80 hours a week, that's like double what normal people do. Uh, maybe not Singaporeans, uh, Singapore work as hard also, I guess. I would take it much easier in life. Lah. Uh, yeah. Maybe instead of four videos, I would just do one video and do one course. Just basically take it easier. Lah. I wouldn't want to die young. <laughs> How are you on track? Uh, oh, my uh, I would say 50%, but it's not a linear thing. It's going to be faster, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you realize this. Like, the more money you earn, the more money you earn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. because it's, 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 a com it's, it's a compounding thing, not just in the investments, but also in your life. Like, when you are sure. working as a waiter, you're earning this much, but once you're upgraded from a waiter to manager, it opens you up to other manager roles elsewhere, and you can continue climbing up. <laughs> and it will be a compounding effect upwards. And when you are higher, you will meet 
different kinds of people. Some of them will even give you new work opportunities, another new maybe business, start a new business together with them, that kind of thing. So it's, it's always a compounding thing, both in your life, your work, your investments, everywhere. What's your monthly expenses? Personally, I, yes. I don't spend a lot on myself. Maybe yeah. it's like 500 to 800 dollars or even lesser. But for if you include my entire family with my kids and so on, I, I guess it'll be like 2,000, 3,000. <laughs> uh, Two, three. Because, yes, yeah. yeah there's, there's food. I need to make my wife happy. <laughs> it, it, go to eat nice food with her now, every now and then. And my kid has to go to school. There's the whole insurance thing going on. My house to loan, all this add up to around 2, 3K. You live in a HDB? Correct. HDB. You rent or you, you own? I own, I own. I'm still paying mortgage, but so this is a, a, is a natural thing for, at least for PRs and for Singaporeans. It makes a lot more sense to own your property just because you can. <laughs> just because the government makes it, the whole thing, HDB yeah. is affordable. Yeah. Uh, although some Singaporeans will disagree with me, like, they'll say it's unaffordable now. But I do believe it's affordable. Because there's the whole CPF thing going on, yeah. where, where you work and you contribute 20% of your pay, your employer contributes 17% of your pay to that. So basically you have 37% of your pay going into this whole CPF savings scheme. And that 70, 30, just from that alone, is enough for you to own a three-room, four-room flat HDB. Why would you rent a house when there's the whole money there already? ready there for you to use it already. So you're making maybe five times or six, seven times more than you're spending uh -huh. and you're still stressed about money. Why am I stressed? Yeah. Because like Why stressed? once I have a family, right, it's not just about me only. Like easily, right now my income, mm -hmm. even if I don't work, my income is, is definitely more than, more than enough for me to retire already. Yeah. But I also want to like <clears throat> allow my wife to have enough to retire so that she don't have to work as hard. At least I want to provide that option for her to retire or at least find a, a part-time job or quit her job if, if she needs to. So that's the second step. Uh, first is myself, then my wife. Then the next step is to allow my kids to have enough to yeah. at least not be worried about the education thing in the future. Mm. So that's three steps. I wouldn't say I'm that stressed. La. I'm, I'm right now comfortable. It's just that uh, this is the whole upbringing that I'm I'm in. I'm being taught to not spend money anyhow. And right now I can see why, because that money has a bigger goal in than yeah. just buying handbags, than just eating food. It's to provide my family to have this, it's called a genera generational wealth, la, to give them yeah. this money so that they don't have to worry about money <laughs> in the future. So this can be passed down later on. La. And the other thing is that I do have, they call it wise, la, wise. Once I've start spending, I'm worried that I must catch on to, to this whole habit of spending. La. Like in the past, actually not a, not a saver in the past. When I'm 10 years old, 12 years old, I used to buy games all the time. I used to wipe out all my savings on video games. Uh -huh. <laughs> so right now I have to control myself not to repeat the same thing. Actually spend a lot of money <clears throat> if I want to. La. I saw the video on your channel. You were saying like, okay, you can actually retire in Singapore. It's, it's not a bad thing. Can you elaborate on that? Singapore is a good place for you to retire if you have enough money to retire. And that will only be possible for Singaporeans if they have enough savings, if they have enough money in their CPF. Because the CPF, once you turn 65 years old, it gives you a guaranteed payout for life. <laughs> I, will, I can't even find this kind of thing elsewhere in the world. Like, but how, Singapore. how much is it? Like rough? So it depends, say, on, depends on the CPF? Yeah, guess, it depends yeah. on the CPF. So let's say if you have about 500K in it, it will give you 4K every month for your entire life. It's a guaranteed payout. <laughs> What's the like main lessons that you learn after quitting your job and like being like full-time YouTuber? I guess the main thing that I learned is that you are always in control of your destiny. Oh, it sounds very cliche, but I, I do believe that. Like, like if you complain that things are expensive in Singapore, just know that you have, as a Singaporean, you have options to move elsewhere. Like for that Jean girl, I interviewed her on my, on my channel a while ago. Uh, yeah. she, this Jean Warunkawa, she was working as a lawyer. But then she didn't like her job. Um, she quit her lawyer job and start doing side business, uh, mm. e-commerce stuff, uh, and, and now YouTube. And that allowed her to move to Bali and retire already at the age of like, I think 35, 38, 39. Ah, uh, this girl, Jane. Yeah, Jane. As Singaporeans, your options are a lot more just because the Sing dollar allows you to have a lot more options. Uh, like imagine if you want to buy an iPhone in Malaysia, it would take them three months to afford, maybe one, two months, maybe, maybe not three, <laughs> but one, two months just to buy an iPhone. But for Singapore, you just need to spend like one week of your pay to afford an iPhone already. Yeah. So just because of this strength, like, it allows you to go elsewhere and retire immediately. <laughs> and you retire immediately. You can do it right now, actually. Yes, I think everyone can do it already if they, if they want to. If you don't like Singapore, 
uh, there are options for you. Yeah. Um, and Singapore is a place where like, for both the rich people and the poor people can thrive. Mm. Uh, there are options for the poor and options for the rich. If you complain that Singapore is an expensive place, uh, just know that there are options. You are such a kind and enjoyable person. Thanks so much for deciding to watch more videos on my channel. I like you a lot. Yes, you. See you there. Click on it.